because I tell everybody the crux of cybersecurity to me is common sense. It's like, you know, hey, you wouldn't go to sleep and leave your doors unlocked. Why don't you set up a new device and leave the default password? You can literally Google whatever your device is, default passwords for someone. So and so that's what it's you can do. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm saying <laughs> sometimes the, the default password is admin. Yep. Admin one. Oh, so you're saying you didn't watch the solar eclipse? I didn't watch it because I was working, but like I could see it getting like dark outside. Like I saw like how I saw the I saw the process of it going from like light outside to dark, then pitch black, and then when it lit back up. Which it was still cool to see, you know, it go from light to dark, but I didn't actually see like the eclipse itself. I think it was on the opposite side of where I was faced at. I saw it at this window right here. I uh, let the window. I said, "Dang, it's dark," but I really wasn't paying attention to it. And it's also because, <laughs> as a kid, I read this book called Tangerine, and it was about this dude who looked at the sun and had to wear these thick glasses. Well, he thought that's what he did, and then he found out some other stuff that happened to him when he was a kid. But I was like, "Man, I ain't finna uh, lose my vision." Or you, know, you had people on Twitter talking about, "Hey, I got my superpowers and <laughs> all that stuff." <laughs> see got stuff I ain't gonna link to move out of stuff. like I recently so I recently redid my like office and my desk so I got rid of my real big monitor and so now I got two monitors right here my other big monitor I'm giving it away along with my, my other desk and so now I got like more space over here um that's why the camera I'm not turned this way now I can just look straight at you and talk well me and my desk is, we still over here thugging. <laughs> we still over here doing her thing. It's a lot of stuff up here. I need to clean it up. I really just need to add some shows and get this table <laughs> management system together because it's insane. I got cable management stuff over here. It was cheap. It was like a bundle, like Velcro ties and these little black sleeves on the cables and all that little fun stuff. But... Let's talk about this real quick. All right. So it's BMF season three, episode six just passed. And everybody should have watched it by now. What you thought about the episode? Better than the, the last few episodes. I, I'm i here for the drama between the parents. So like that's what's keeping me going. Everything else is just all over the place. But I think I really enjoyed the fact that I feel like the content's getting better. The content's getting deeper. Like the story's starting to get more interesting. Like the first four to I would say four episodes. This episode and the last one weren't that good. Um, Meech is. I just still the acting just isn't there for me. It just it's not there. But I loved Harry. I loved Harry. Um, the whole situation, her having the baby, um, him not answering because he was with his other girl. It was just a lot going on. But I enjoyed it. It's getting better for me. So, actually, no, last episode, the one before this was actually pretty good. When they well, That was the, a shootout? Yeah. Okay, it was so much shooting going on. It was, yeah. it, was a, it was a shootout for like a half the episode. Yeah, when they went to Techwood, they had the shootout. And then, of course, you know, 2 chains. you know, that he got dropped off. <laughs> yeah, it was good, but the only thing is, I thought we always say the more rappers or or whatever influences you have in the show, lets you know like the the way the acting will go. So, Sweetie's supposed to be in like this episode, so I already know it ain't gonna be that good. I was just about to say bye, but no, I mean I'm I'm with you. Um, let me see. So, oh, no, go ahead. I was nah, gonna say, go what's ahead. the what's the girl's name with the teeth? I was Over just about her. to bring her up. Henrietta. But let, can we go ahead and kill her off, please? Because the character is it's not but it's I get what they're not trying believable. to do, but she's not believable for me at all. She's she acts like an animal in not a realistic type of way. Yeah, she had a flamethrower. I'm trying to see why Buddy thought it was a good idea to walk to somebody with a flamethrower. I'm trying to figure out why he didn't stop drop and roll. True. I don't even know. Why did he 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 was standing up for way more seconds than he should have been? He 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 didn't have to die. Were they going to school back then? Um, I mean, I were know. they being taught that in school back then? They should have been. 
I I don't know how long stop, drop, and roll has been a thing, but he could use some help. Yeah, and then I, you know my boy Detective Brown, he on Demon Time, so it's a matter of time. But I always said I always said that he should have um Detective Brown really should have been ha- like working with Meech and them, even though he was mad. But they wouldn't have did that to Kevin. Like Meech, not that type of person, at least in the show. Definitely not. No, he definitely is on the show for sure. Like he's. I don't think he would have let that fly. You know, he got a little weak spot for kids. He got kids. Terry got kids. So I yeah. feel like he, she, and Henrietta was so disgusting for that. And she, she should have just continued to take her beef and issues out on him. But I guess because you couldn't reach him, you know, that was the next thing. His, his death was definitely sad. I, I, I don't feel like they, they should have gave him more room to be sad in that scene. Like, I feel like it should have been a little bit longer so that his vengeance could have been felt more. Cause we already know he don't like them, but I feel like if they would have played in on my son just died on those emotions and it would have just drove more beef and fuel between, you know, him and me. Yeah, for sure. But I think, you know, also they're trying to, tell so many different stories in, in what 45 50 minutes so they're running into that problem also i wonder if blaze gonna be like kanan because i know kanan would have been dealt with sean <laughs> so <laughs> we'll definitely see like that but let me i know these people are like man what are they talking about we can't hear the line about this but let me let me get some gunshots real quick there we go all right, wherever you at, wake up real quick, man. This is the Textual Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Unreal. We got our co-host here today, Miss Destiny. Hey, y'all. <laughs> and um, I don't even know what episode this is. I'm going to put it in the title later. But we're going to, of course, comment on some more current events for our more casual listeners. And then we're going to actually get into the stuff that y'all came to see today. But if you're watching this on YouTube, you know what to do. Please like and subscribe. All you got to do is subscribe. It don't cost you nothing. Subscribe. And if you want to help the channel out some more, join the Patreon. Join the Patreon right here. The cheapest tier is like five bucks. Like it really helps out with everything we want to do on the channel because eventually we want to we want to move this from being virtual to being a standalone in-person thing as well. So anything you donate can help. And also, if you're listening, follow us on Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Now, you have one of your other topics that you want to talk about, and I think I'm gonna let you take it away with this one. So you oh, say gosh. the city girl, you think the city girls gonna break up? I don't think that um, I saw they made amends. I don't they made amends. Um, uh, so they were arguing on Twitter. Um, I don't even really know how it started. Um, but I remember seeing um like they were just going back and forth, you know, J uh, Miami, Young Miami felt like um, JT's new song was about her, um, which I feel like if you felt it was about you, why was you singing it? Why didn't you hit her up and be like, girl, is this about me? Like, I don't know. It just kind of gave sucker a little bit because if you felt like the song was about you, but you bopping and bouncing to it, that doesn't make sense. But anyways, I digress. I feel like they've been had tension for a really long time. I feel like that tension was apparent when... JT was on Carisha, please. It just really wasn't a smooth episode. You could be, you could definitely sense there was some tension in their friendship. Um, so I just feel like, you know, this last situation just allowed it to spill over. But um, I mean, do we really care as long as they both continue to put out music? That's kind of how I feel. I don't know that at the end they squashed it. You know, it was a phone conversation. Tweets were deleted, things of that sort. But um, I don't think people really care as long as, like I said, as long as they continue to still drop music. I know Carisha's trying to branch out and do some other things, but JT, we here for you, girl. Keep dropping them bars. So, I mean, if you want to be like totally honest with this thing, we don't care. <laughs> We don't care. We've been thought the city girls so are probably done just because one person was being a pack mule for uh, an alleged pack mule for Diddy. And JT's been with Uzi and trying to like stay relevant. And it's so funny about, I know for a fact that the show Rap Shit was like loosely based on them. No, I thought it was about them. 
I thought it was like confirmed. No, they were executive producers, so that's why I like. Yeah, but I know it's not everything because you, you would yeah. try to probably like get some stuff away, but it's similar. You mm-hmm. you have the one who wants to be really good at it and trying to do what they gonna do, and the other one doing what they doing, and and you could tell like even if we like we we've always felt like like Carisha's. Uh, focus stopped being on music with everything else that she was doing and um you know i think jt i think they had some issues with jt getting cool with nikki or something i don't know you know the, the girl's always beefing and that kind of leads us into getting that out of the way the bigger story really was jt and glorilla getting into it yeah that was ugly that was real ugly but i feel like i don't feel like what glorilla said was you know, she dropped your name, but she didn't say nothing crazy behind it. And like when I listened to the song, I was just like, I don't Which song understand. Did she say her I don't even know what she basically she was like. No, she hey, did. You know, I know she talking about she was slapping people or something. No, J uh, Glorilla said like, and me and JT ain't the coolest, but we ain't beefing neither. Like that's literally what she said. So it really it wasn't. She basically was like, I wish all the rap girls would stop beefing and they could come together because the song with Nicki and Cardi, blah, blah, blah. And then the next line was like, me and JT um, ain't cool, but we ain't beefing either. But something like that. So I feel like that was okay. her just trying to clear the air and say like, like what she didn't say nothing crazy, slick, yeah, slide. So JT want to out herself. But I feel like I didn't know like the depths of all the drama and I slapped you or you said I slapped you or people thought I didn't know all of that until they got to arguing. And so that's what I gauged from it. That's why JT was feeling some type of way, because I guess there was a situation where Glorilla had allegedly slapped JT, but she didn't slap her. I guess she hit her with her purse or something along those lines. And so when she made that bar in the song, um, slapping rap, slapping yeah. rap beast. Yeah. I feel like that just played on that situation. And so JT was feeling some type of way because you, you didn't slap me. And then it just boiled over to like, you know, petty stuff and not yeah. well, pettiness. pettiness. I, I, a hit dog will always holler. A hit dog will always holler. And I know you briefly want to talk about uh Glorilla on club Shay Shay. I didn't finish. All I, didn't know she, I didn't even watch it. But I saw a lot of clips, but like I didn't know that she was living like that. Like I didn't know she was she had it so hard, you know, coming up, growing up. So I feel like it made me understand her a bit more and also respect kind of where she at today. Yeah. You know, image wise, money wise, that when she first signed, people was clowning her about how much she signed for, but like you know, kind of full circle moment for me with her just kind of understanding her a lot better. Like she really came from nothing for real, yep. for real. And you can tell her friends and how her teeth and stuff used to look. You could tell she had, yep. but also people are trying to clown her what she signed for. It's actually a good thing because if you got a low amount that you signed for, that's typically an advance. You got to mm-hmm. make that money back. So if it's a low, she's probably made that money back already. Yep. I don't think people understand that. Like on the lowest of levels, like when I did my LinkedIn learning course, I had an advance and I still have made that advance back for them just because that's really, I don't like how the way that they kind of do LinkedIn learning. That's neither here nor there. But <laughs> um, but I watched some of it in, in spurts. Uh, mm-hmm. I know they were making that uh, Laportier cognac, which I got to try. And uh, I think but she had some Taylor Port wine or something up there. She's hilarious. At the end of the day, the day got to end. I've been um, using that. <laughs> I, that. I was like, okay. One thing, <laughs> one thing, one thing about Club Shay Shay, he gonna have some people up there with some quotables. Yep. So, so far, that's right under um, what Cat Williams say, but you got allegiance to losers, and that's not like you or something like that. You have an unnatural allegiance to losers. Yeah. So. I I appreciated the interview. I didn't know I needed that interview either, you know. So I appreciate him putting someone on, but like you didn't even I didn't even know watching the clips that like, oh my God, I actually do want to learn more about her. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was actually listening to his episode with Cam Newton, so I didn't even finish it. I rarely finish all the podcasts, they'd be so long. So I just try to listen to them in spurts on it's like they're really interesting, engaging, like the Cat Williams and Joe Rogan one was pretty cool because it was filled with like conspiracies, but very interesting conspiracies. But 
before we really get into the nitty gritty, um, yeah, man, uh, Mr. J. Cole apologized. Listen, the audience, I'm gonna play a little snippet of this. I don't want to hear no talk like this from him ever again. Yes, I don't want to ever hear this again from Cole. I promise, niggas, I guarantee it. I put my stamp of fucking authenticity, nigga. Ain't no nigga better than me in this fucking planet. I swear to God. I don't want to hear that no more. Not out of him. Not out of him. He jumped out there too fast and wanted to apologize. But I'm like, you didn't really say nothing that bad. Just stand on it and y'all could have pieced it up behind the scenes. But my man said he couldn't sleep. Like, they got to hold his <laughs> He will never be number one or two. Hell, I already said Big Sean in the top three now because of because of what he did. It don't mean he don't have the, the ability that he's been had, but it just don't hit the same. None of the lyrics hit the same right now. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna be revisionist history, but like the younger kids probably come through and listen to like J. Cole. I'm like, oh, he was cold because they're not gonna know in real time what he went up there and said. Yeah. So I I get it to an extent but i feel like as a rapper he should have just ate him up and while he was eating him up been like you still my brother you know i still respect you but don't ever come for me now i'm finna eat you up and it was a terrible trash response to what kendrick i don't think it was terrible i I thought it was was, terrible no i think he was honest because i I think it was I think for him it was light, but it was too light. Like he was too unserious about it. Well, I think it should have been like that because technically, like he was a casualty casualty at war. Most of the bars and like that was aimed at Drake, but it was some thrown at Cole. They've thrown little jabs throughout the rapping, but I think it was right. I think, Ooh. like I don't know. There's been rumblings about there were some calls behind the scenes with Cole and Kendrick, maybe, and you know. The fact that there is a little chink in the armor of if you bring up to Pimp a Butterfly, because people can be honest about it. I mean, it came out during 2015, all the police brutality stuff and everything else was going on. So it got a boost on the visuals and the subject matter. But when you think about outside of Al Wright and maybe King Kunta, what songs are, uh, oh, I think I love myself is on there. But when you think about like what songs is really people playing from there, um, you got to really just actually look at it. Now, like for me, Good Kid, Mad City is the best. And then it's Damn. I think Damn was probably like more commercially uh, successful, but it's cool. Mr. Morale was cool, but compared to Kendrick's other work, I don't think it was like just all that. But I mean, it is what it is. I, he just could never, like for the last three, five years, he's been telling everybody he's the best. And you can't say that. If I put some on wax on this pot, I'm not going to get up here and say I couldn't sleep at night. I may talk to you behind the scenes and I'm going to tell you why I dissed you. You know, and then if you want to accept it, you accept it. If not, it's up and it's stuck. But that's I, really I how you. That's, that's he, didn't how I, say, he didn't say anything insane to where he needed to issue a state. Like he act like he said, I hate you. I hope you die. A death upon you. Like he didn't say anything remotely right. that tough but i guess for him a lot of people are alluding to man somebody got some dirt on him so he's just like uh, i don't i don't want no parts of it i don't want no parts of it i don't know only time will tell i think this is some of the stuff we was talking about about people being battle tested and and the only person that was really battle tested is drake and so he's actually just been playing it the smartest uh just because if you're dealing with a person as capable as Kendrick, you just can't hop out there and say anything, which is what Cole kind of learned and yeah. crashed and burned. Absolutely. He could have just he could have just tweeted something and said, I dare him to say my name or something. And then if it wasn't no issue, they could have pieced it up after that. But I don't know. Y'all gotta take J they've been calling him J Fold for a while. So how <laughs> <laughs> they how they feel about him. But I know this is your segment you want to talk about right here 
What is that a prophecy? Yes, yes. So, let's get so into I've been I've been getting a lot of questions from people who are interested in the field, and they always are like, "I'm interested in GRC. What's this? What's that?" So I thought it'd be good to talk about it. So what is data privacy? So data privacy is basically protecting your personal information, but also ensuring that it's being handled, stored, and processed securely. Um, so that sensitive data could be your name, address, any of your financial details, basically anything that could be personally identifiable. Um, so data privacy is a big thing right now. It's a big focus. Um, it's a big industry. I feel like it could be strategic if you were interested in going down a GRC route, but only if we, as a country, establish a federal, you know, data protection law regulation requirement, something equivalent to like the GDPR, because we have a lot of um, state and sector specific regulations in the U.S. as opposed to having something that's like overarching over all of that. Um, so that's a little bit about data privacy. Ironically, since you were talking about data privacy, I need to actually bring up this one. This is like our second time talking about AT&T. Do you got AT&T? I do. Did you get hit up by AT&T? I didn't. Yet. Okay. I got I got something. We're gonna I'm gonna briefly get go into the article really quickly and then I'm gonna tell people what they should well what I would recommend that they do. Okay. So let me actually stop this. Okay, so for y'all don't know, AT&T suffered a breach, I want to say about three years ago, three, four years ago. And they kind of were mum on what happened or how the leak ha uh, happened. You know, a lot of times as your company, you might want to downplay and say, ah, well, shoot, that, that ain't real. Like we, we got everything covered. But so AT&T suffered another breach and they confirmed millions of customer records posted online were actually authentic. And I but want to say the attackers actually dump the data and let people go see if it's their stuff on there. Yep. So the information that they have, email address, mailing address, date of birth, phone number, and social security number. Like at this point, AT&T need to give me more than that little uh, $15, $20 to try to give people for them class settlements. Like everybody needs to get paid because this is a mess. So, yeah, the leaked customer information dated back to 2019 and earlier, according to AT&T, records contain valid data on more than 7.9 million current AT&T customers. And three years ago, after a subset of leaked data first appeared online, which prevented any meaningful analysis of the data, the full cache of 73 million leaked customer records was dumped online last month, allowing customers to verify that their data was genuine. Some of the records included duplicates. Man, that's a lot of that's a lot of data, man. But if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that it wasn't directly AT&T getting breached. I believe a third party that handles AT&T data got breached, if I'm not mistaken, which is typically always the third party because they know the main company is going to be fortified like a fortress. So they're always going to try to get in from a, a place that's probably not as strong. So AT&T eventually acknowledged that the leaked data belongs to its customers, including about 65 million former customers. Companies experience data breaches that affect large number of people are required to disclose the incident with U.S. Attorney General under state data breach notification laws. So, yeah, that's pretty much on that on um, that on that. But let me go solo. All right. So to add some more context to this, well, actually going to actually make a brief mention of a of a sponsor so i was asking destiny if she got contacted by, by at&t yet and she said no and guess what neither have i but guess who did contact me so this portion of the video will be sponsored by aura and aura is an actual data privacy solution as well as vpn as well as it could 
check your transactions. It's pretty much like an all in, um, all in one stop for making sure that you're protected on the internet. It uses AI to see if data brokers have your information and it's removing things constantly all the time. So actually, a couple of days ago, R sent me two text messages. Hey, your email was found on the dark web. Hey, your social security number was found on the dark web. You should you know, freeze your credit or whatever to make sure nobody uses your social, um, your social security number without you knowing. So if I was relying on AT&T, I may not get notified until next week, two weeks from now. And granted, I don't use AT&T for a cell carrier. I only use them for internet because I have to at the place I stay at. But the fact that they waited so long to tell people, like, okay, cool, if it's your name and email, is fine. But if people's socials are accessed and you're taking forever to notify them, that's a problem. People can go get whole cars and everything <laughs> with your social and you would never know. And just imagine you know, the old people who don't have like the access out of stuff. So R is cool. You can have it on your phone, on the computer, on your phone. It can store your passwords as a VPN. Anytime I make a purchase or I, I may be applying a credit or something and say, hey, is this you? And it's just really convenient. So if you want to try out R, the link would be in the description. They have a free 14 day trial where you can try it out for yourself. And yeah, so just click the link in the description and try R to keep your information safe. Because I was like, man, that's wild. I, I really don't use at and like that. And they no, still haven't said anything. I have, I have a question. Go ahead. So for people who've never been in this situation before, or like they've been in this situation, but they just, you know, kind of weren't aware. Can you tell the viewers and the listeners how you felt? When you got that notification or if you didn't feel anything because you've gotten these before like how did you feel the first time that you found out some of your information was on the dark web so i've never let me get my words together correctly so i've never experienced my social being on dark web i experienced like other places getting hacked emails and, like, and stuff I, yeah. yeah like an email or something being used but the social was a little bit different so Oh, it was like a little bit alarming because, like I said, I'm trying to see what is AT and T going to give me for me being inconvenienced, having to probably freeze my credit. Because all they're going, I don't know, I don't care about the. I, we already have tools that are cheaper. Oh, get your Experian monitoring. Get your. I don't need that. I got my own monitoring. That's much better than Experian. They still had Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax still ain't said nothing to me. So I don't need any of that. <laughs> I got what I need. I need you to pay me for not doing your due diligence and handling this data that these people have access to or, <clears throat> or not figuring out early on what third party caused our data to be at risk and why they're not following proper protocol, why they didn't disclose it fast enough. So we can find out, Hey, who's the person that did it? Like, those are the questions that need to be answered. Like, so over they there, like, scary. Them, like, that's why I like Verizon. Everybody's some of Verizon expensive. Well, it's expensive, but they really had these issues. That's why. And they work with top tier security teams and third parties as well, as you can tell. But for the people who may not have experienced this before, because ironically, a couple weeks ago, my aunt called me about stuff like this and how she got the message like, hey, your information somewhere. And she didn't, she kind of panicked. She said she couldn't sleep and stuff because she's older. I think my aunt is uh, 70. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's alarming for sure. Yeah, so she got uh, she got like LifeLock, and then she got uh, I think malware bytes has like uh, some type of tool for that, and you know she's don't know what to do because you know at the end of the day it's not on you, and that's the that's the sucky thing, and that's why data privacy is always one of the main things that people are trying to figure out. Okay, who has access to the data? That's the main reason when people make all these claims about AI coming to take jobs and everything else. We always say, well, who's going to have the data? And what are they going to do with it? And how exactly. long are you going to have it for? And are you going to sell it to a third party? And so on. What is GDPR is the next topic in relation to data privacy? So GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. And it's basically a set of rules that were designed to protect the personal data and privacy 
of EU citizens. So EU being the European Union. So what it does is it gives individuals more control over their personal data and how it's being used by organizations. Um, and that does apply to organizations, whether they are in the EU or outside of the EU. So basically, if you are dealing with any data for a customer that's in the EU, then you have to abide by the GDPR. Um, so that is what we don't have here in the U.S. is we don't have an overarching, um, you know, federal law that is comprehensive like the GDPR is uh, for the for the EU. Um, so why don't we have the equivalent? Um, well, unlike other countries, we do we have a more sectorial approach. So if you think about HIPAA, everyone's heard of HIPAA. Um, so with that, we have these laws and regulations that are more um, state specific or specific to different sectors. You got the financial industry that has to follow um, laws. You got the computer fraud and abuse um, and so on. But the absence of that federal legislation that we're missing is a result of policy debates. You got competing interests. You got um, people advocating for different things on both sides. You got the policymakers who are confused about what to do. Um, and then you also have technology companies who also have a say in this process as well. So there's a ton of different views um, that are in that are in conversation about how to find the right balance between privacy um, rights and then also, I guess I would say like innovation. So um, we don't even know how we can enforce these things and, and so on. But I don't understand why we're not using GDPR as a template, you know, for well, us to develop to our, our own. own. So there's a lot that's in play when it, when we start talking about data privacy and laws and things of that sort. So that's just a high level overview of why we don't have an equivalent here in the U.S. Yeah, I agree. And while you were talking, I looked up when the GDPR get introduced. It's 2016, but I remember when it got implemented, it was like May, what, May 25th, 2018. Yeah. And I say that because that's around the time I was getting ready to start like my next job after being unemployed in a while. And all I kept on seeing on LinkedIn was by GDPR. And if you notice back then, if you saw on the internet, all these sites you were on kept on asking you to like uh, accept all these cookies and and everything else and all these different things that GDPR required if you did business in the, the EU. So I think we do need the standard, standardization process here. Now, how would they, they go about doing it? I don't know. You know, we're the, the Wild Wild West. Everybody's pretty much allowed to do whatever they want to do. Whoever has the most cash makes the rules. So that is kind of how that goes. Now, there was another breach that happened it was home depot home depot suffered another breach as well and like i said i call it job security and i thought i had that oops i thought i had it on here i guess i didn't put it uh put the link on here i could find it really quickly because i got it in my I, I, I can give a quick summary while you're pulling it up so in the home depot case um third-party software or excuse me, a third-party software vendor was the culprit, um, and they were who exposed the data. So what was exposed in this case, I think it was about 10,000 employees, their corporate IDs, um, their names and email addresses were exposed. And so what happened is while the third-party software vendor was testing out their systems, they made public um, basically like a small set of data. And that small set of data that they made available contained those corporate IDs, names, and email addresses. So why is that bad? Well, because those email addresses, let's just start there, outside of the names and the corporate IDs, but with the email addresses being exposed, now phishing campaigns are on the line against the employees of that company um, because they have their email addresses. So now they can target, craft, you know, design um, campaigns that are a bit more um, 
what's the word I'm looking for that are bit, yeah absolutely a bit more sophisticated and targeted um, for that particular company so maybe they're trying to mimic another third party software vendor that they know that they do business with or maybe they're going to start sending out um, you know those business email compromise scenarios so sending out like a fake invoice and trying to get that paid um, but that's just a gist and you could take it. You covered that uh, wonderfully because I, like I said, most of these things are always third party, but it's always big of a headline if you say Home Depot breach or AT and T breach, not whoever that third party is because they're not as known. So mm-hmm. that's one of the clickbaity things they do with these. And funny enough, I will I'll say ironically how you mentioned phishing. So there phishing is, is the same right now, man. So funny enough, there. It was like two days ago, I saw it in my security news. Multi-stage malware phishing. Well, technically, the, the article is about uh, them attackers using uh, obfuscation techniques to do multi-stage malware phishing. And this is one that we actually do need to look at because this will be one of the ones my future blue teamers, you deal with phishing a lot. But like I say in these interviews, they always say, well, how do you keep up with latest attacks and current trends? This is something that you would want to know about to where even if they hadn't seen it yet, you bringing it up in an interview would be very cool. Oh, no, that's not it. And after this, we probably talk about people now, like I said, we've always said, they're using AI to construct malicious. Oh, script. I can't wait. I love that one. I love that one. So let's share this tab. I did a, um, a summary of this one too, the multi-stage one. Yeah, I wanted to show... You could talk about it, but I also want to show the uh, the graphics that they have for it, pretty much. Um, to actually show people like the breakdown of what happens in the actual attack. I thought that was pretty cool. But like I said, it's pretty much that they are using, what's it called, SVG? Let's see, here you go. So in the latest campaign analyzed by the cybersecurity firm, the SVG file serves as a conduit to drop a zip archive that contains a batch script, likely created using Batcloak, which then unpacks the scrub crypt batch file <laughs> to ultimately execute Venom Rat, but not before setting up persistence on the host taking steps to bypass AMSI and ETW uh, protections. Let me see if we can make this bigger. And yeah, let me see if I can zoom in on this. Okay. This should be, let me, if I take this away, that might be better for them. All right. So, guys, as we see, this is the email that's coming in. Oh, they can't see my mouse. Oh, well. And it's just giving you the layers of what really happened. So, of course, we have all this advanced technology that can stop a lot of these things. But this is still the number one thing. And I believe the person still has to click on this actual attachment for this to kind of, if it registers a click, for all this stuff to happen. So look at how how advanced that this is to go through the links of it. And they are doing this by, I think I missed and like talked too much beforehand, but let me go back. The premise of this is invoice phishing. Yep. Yep. Again. And that's obviously on the rise. Yes. It's always, I mean, that's the biggest one when when you're dealing with uh, any company, they know they have many vendors. And so a lot of time attackers, the long, the, the stupid play is to try to make noise in the environment fast. The smart play is, hey, let me get a, a small or mid-sized company. Let me compromise them. And let me see who their vendors are. Let me let me just look through the email list. Um, I had a, was it a consultation or something? Somebody was talking about how they stopped a threat or something like that, where somebody's account was compromised and the attacker decided to set up, like, I think all email coming in to an RSS feed and it was automatically deleted. I don't something, but it was something like small that you really wouldn't notice unless she was really paying attention to uh, security events. But like all these different things, like we clicked on Venerat or Batcloak and all these different things, they will kind of tell you their origins. And so now people are just tying all these things together 
<laughs> in order to really like get you like in, in, and put you on the hook. Because once it establishes a persistence, then they can start doing what they got to do and say, we got your files. Or what you going to pay us? Definitely. I didn't want to like kind of read all of it. If you guys want to read all of it, I'll probably try to put all these links in the description because this is the stuff that kind of helps you understand it as a whole and understand what issues, because they're still like as, as good as the, the proof points are, they still mess up a lot and they require a lot. Because it's not even just about having the tool. Like it's about having the tool and knowing how to configure that tool. You can have any email security tool. What you you can have anyone, but do you know about all the features? The features are there for a reason. Do you know about um, just the different the different capabilities of those tools and making sure that you have them configured correctly? Because okay, let's think about it. I bought this tool two years ago. Well, when's the last time I looked at what new features have been made available with this tool, Proofpoint right. or Exchange Online, you know, however, whatever tool you're using um, right. from an email perspective. But yeah. um, that article is a lot. I, I wanted to quickly, very quickly just explain what happened. Mm -hmm. So it started with fake emails and they were pretending to be invoices. So those emails have files attached to them. And when those files are open, they're infecting the computer with the with the bad software. And so the bad actors are using two tools to try to hide their software and also at the same time make it hard for any antivirus detection programs to be able to detect their malicious software. So one of those tools is Batcloak. So Batcloak is just there to help them load their software secretly. And then they have Scrub Crypt, which is used to hide their software's code. So when someone clicks on that file in the email, it sets off a chain of events. So the first one is it opens that hidden file that contains the software. And that software is that Venom, Venom Rat, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And so that lets the bad actors basically take control of the computer. And once they have control, then they can steal any information, execute any commands um, that they need. Um, but it also lets them spread more malware. Um, so then you have the other ones you see there. So the X-Worm, the Rimcoast, so on. Um, but basically, they're using a number of tools um, that are helping them hide their identity and basically trying to remain persistent, like you were saying, on the system. They're, they're, they're trying to hide themselves in more than one way, and that's why they're using a that's, that's why they're using multiple tools in this type of um, attack in this scenario. But this one was a bit more complex. So I just wanted to give a quick breakdown on what happened. And all obfuscate means is to render obscure, unclear, or unintelligible. And so a lot of times that comes through with them using different techniques. So you don't really know what it is. Pretty yep. simple. So well, on this end, their way of doing obfuscation was sending in, starting it with the attachment that's a SVG file, which is scalable vector graphics. So in a sense, it's pretty much steganog steganog uh, steganography in a sense, because it's an image and they're hiding malicious code in the image. Yeah, you wouldn't know. Well, you would know if you. That's if you so me. cool, too. I did that in class and it's that is just a completely different ball game. You would be amazed at what you can do. Yeah. I think, though, people have to pay attention. There are a lot of now if it's sophisticated enough to where they compromise the person that's supposedly sending the invoice. Uh, so you just really got to pay attention to the verbiage, the picture. The signature, like you'd be surprised. A lot of times a person's signature gives off they're that person in that environment or not. That's why a lot of companies want employees to have certain signatures so we recognize it's you. Because if you get compromised and you don't have the right signature, then we say, hmm, what's, what's going on with your signature? You know, normally it might say sent from iPhone or whatever, but if it's something different, like, you know, it's supposed to be like this on your phone and everything else. But they they use obfuscation to, to get in their steganography. And we see this a lot. Like people, they're always reporting fish. <laughs> Sometimes it's just spam. And so there are like different tools. Like I said, like, like you have like the proof points or like the co-fences. 
Uh, I forgot what the other one we used to use. And so they kind of act as a buffer. Like if you hit the report fish stuff, it goes there and you can uh, check it out. Of course, Microsoft uh, has Third Explorer, Purview, and some other other stuff. And you can kind of interact with the attachment there or take it to a sandbox and kind of oh, yeah. yep. see what happens. So that's the best thing I would say. If you're not familiar with the sender and another big key too, so you were talking about Proofpoint and you were talking about having it configured correctly because they're the attackers have a lot of time. So they're developing different ways to kind of get this stuff out here. So for one, you want to make sure, hey, pay attention to the subject. If it says external, that's always something to pay attention to. Pay attention to the domain. Make sure the domain is of a, maybe a vendor or something that you guys actually deal with. And it's not a typo squat domain where it looks like it, but it's not the right one. You definitely got yeah. the domain. Also, you can implement, hey, you haven't really mentioned this sender before. So if it's a vendor you always do business with, but it says, hey, you hadn't interacted with them before, that's a red flag. Those are like three simple things you can kind of look at to be sure of if this is could possibly be malicious or not. But yeah, and those are all features too, like of a product that you have to turn on. So having it, you buying proof point is not enough if you don't turn on the features that'll help you. And most of the features for phishing are targeted around the users and giving them those notifications. Like you said, one, it's someone external. Two, this is someone you haven't communicated with before. And I forgot what the other one you said was, but all of those are features of that product. And as the bad actors are getting smarter, companies are getting smarter and designing solutions to circumvent them. But if you're not keeping up with the product that you bought, then how would you know about those added features that you can turn on? Right. But I, honestly, I don't really just put it strictly on the features because the features could be on. But at the end of the day, the end user is the biggest threat to yeah. your, the end user. End user education. Phishing attack yes. simulations. How often are you doing them? What is included with them? Are you only teaching them how to report? Because then you could be overloading your, you know, your help desk, whoever's receiving those tickets. Are you also teaching them about lookalike domain name spoofing? You know, are you teaching them about other items as it pertains to right. being spoofed? Yeah, I think the issue with all security awareness training is just boring and repetitive. <clears throat> I've always wanted to, I would love to be able to get like a group of people and we create interesting security awareness training and sell it to companies like stuff that, I mean, granted, some of the stuff is you would kind of see cause like everybody is on their phone and stuff now, but if we was able to use likeness or, or something, you know, you, you always see these things, Hey, you won't believe what happened on this post. And there's a Facebook post and somebody clicks on it. Or those type of things. I, I haven't, I have to check out the next time I do security awareness training and, and see what it's telling me because I think a lot of the stuff, they need to have it like in parts. An advanced user or a person who don't know nothing at all. I think that's where the disconnect starts getting from because if you're making everybody do the same thing with a security awareness and I did the same stuff for 10 years, it may be something new in there, but I'm just going to click through it. Oh, that's what people do. What? They click through it. They speed it up. That's what they do. Because I don't, from an end user perspective, I don't have time. I have other things to do outside of get this training done by this date. So what what can I do to hurry up and get it over with? I, I propose, and people say, well, you don't need to get there for doing your job. But I actually propose, hey, if we put some actually really good security ways training out there, Let's give this person, like, you know, every company has their own internal way of reporting employees. So it may be worth some internal uh, employee money or something like that. So you can get you something with it or something, some type of incentive to make people take it seriously. Because people, some people do because they just have common sense. Because I tell everybody the crux of cybersecurity to me is common sense. Common <laughs> that, sense ain't so common. Has. So just like, you know, hey, you wouldn't go to sleep and leave your doors unlocked. Why don't you set up a new device and leave the default password? You can literally Google whatever your device is, default passwords for so-and-so. And so that's what or you, can, or you can guess. Yeah. Well, I'm saying <laughs> sometimes the, the default password is admin. Yep. Admin one. 
And the other article that I uh, found to be interesting was it's a malicious PowerShell script that seemed to be created by AI. And the reason why they believe this AI is because it had a lot of grammar errors. And that's what you run no, into. I thought, it, I thought it was because it didn't have, because there was too, um, too, what is it when you put your comments? Like the comments were too good. Yeah, but I think it was in a way that people don't talk. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So that's what you always see. Like that's a that's a thing with the AI too. You kind of got to make it seem like, hey, make it seem like a person wrote this and or revise some of the stuff because a lot of times is like you said, it is using those language uh, learning models and constructing what it believes to be as a person would be talking. I think that the reason why this is so funny for me is because we know like we can we know when something was written for the most part i can recognize especially if someone if you didn't if you told chat gpt to give you a post right to make a post for you i can tell that you didn't edit that at all like i can tell that that was a hundred percent made you know through the use of ai so i feel like that's why it's funny it's because Whoever did this, they didn't even go in and clean anything up. They were just like, okay, cool. Go on with that. And that's what people typically do when they are first using these type of tools. Yep. Hey, look, the magic company. Side note, um, hopefully we hear some good news. I had a client that got to like the final round of uh, Proofpoint, Thread Intel, uh, Endless Road. We've really been trying to get in Thread Intel over the last couple of months. So um, he already got one internal offer from his company that gave him like a 30k raise but we want to be in threat intel so shout out to him shout out to my friend shamika for helping him with her she's a uh threat intel threat intelligence analyst at twilio so definitely gotta have her back on because she does this like what are we doing like this kind of like i'm not really preparing for a presentation but she actually does the, the presentations when they have all these different things that may be coming against the, the company or what they see in the environment and hey if you got good presentation skills and you like security, you definitely should look into threat intelligence. And if you need help with that, book a call today. And also, if you're still listening to us right now, I am revamping my business model. I will be finally giving you guys that get into cybersecurity course very soon. I'm switching to a new platform and everything. So that's that's coming soon, probably in the next month or so. So just, just keep your eyes peeled on those uh, email blasts I send out to everybody. But I think Proofpoint said they've been tracking this since about 2017, if I'm not mistaken. That should be somewhere down here. Um, but let's read this real quick. A third actor is using a PowerShell script that was likely created with the help of AI, such as ChatGPT, Gemini, or Copilot. The adversary used a script in an email campaign in March that targeted tens of organizations in Germany to deliver the Rada months information still. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> I have to ask AI how to say that. Um, TA547, also known as Scully Spider, has been active since at least, yeah, 2017, delivering a variety of malware for Windows, Z Loader, Teradot, Gootkit, Ursniv, Corbot, all those things. I'm not going to read all that. So yeah, Proofpoint has been tracking TA547 since 2017, and this campaign was the first one where the threat actor was observed using the malware. The info stealer has been distributed since September 2022 to multiple cybercrime groups under the malware as a service model. According to Proofpoint researchers, TA547 impersonated the Metro Cash and Carry German brand in a recent email campaign using invoices. <laughs> Using invoices as a lure for a dozen of organizations across various industries in Germany. But, okay. <clears throat> Just like we were talking. See, that's what I think that's what I like about when we do this, where we say something and then something we brings up automatically shows us what we just said. Like, here's the subject. This is probably not the actual domain. And just look at the email. The email looks like either it's either spamish or like you shouldn't trust it, that you should report as phishing because of this. It's a zip file. The message includes a zip archive 
protected with password March 26, M- well, MAR26, which contained a malicious shortcut file. LNK assessing the shortcut file triggered PowerShell to run a remote script. All right. So this is what Destiny was just talking about. I think you muted. Imagine you didn't stop looking, listen. You unzip that file and put that password in. Just, just imagine you as the user. You're like, oh, what's this? What's in this file? Who's this coming from? And you unzip in it and you put the password in and boom. Now you got this. I think you pronounce it Rada Mantis. Rada Mantis. Yeah. Rada Mantis. Yeah. And then, so here are those comments we were talking about. Like it doesn't like if you were writing this, like you would never like, say that this assumes right. no arguments are needed. You would never say that. Yeah, replace with your actual base sixty four string. Like yeah, use correct. Overload. But this is the this is what it looks like for people who use AI tools. Like we can see that this is not. We can see that this no we we know people don't talk like this. So if you're trying to learn how to code and go in there and change these comments and make them make sense to you, because it made sense for the system to give these to you, but make them make sense for you. Otherwise, we'll know that you just pulled that from an AI tool or system. Daniel Blackford, director of threat research at Proofpoint, clarified for Bleeping Computer that while developers are great at writing code, their comments are usually cryptic or at least unclear and with Oh, so yeah, actually, yeah. users and developers have grammatical errors, and this didn't have as many. Yep. So the PowerShell script suspected of being LLM generated is meticulously commented with impeccable grammar. So you're right. I think, to be fair, I read this after work, and so I thought it had the grammar errors, but it was actually didn't. So, but I mean, that makes sense though, because when you're writing code, I'm leaving comments that make sense to me. I'm not trying to write a comment that anyone can you know, understand I'm writing this comment for me because I know what this, you know, line or section is supposed to do. Mm-hmm. With impeccable grammar, nearly every line of code has some associated comment. Yeah. Every line of code did have a comment. It's crazy. No, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Additionally, based on the output from experience with LLM generating code, the researchers have high to medium confidence that the script TA547 used an email campaign was generated using this type of technology. And I want to say the screenshot below is them generating their own with AI. Yeah, so Bleep Computer used chat GPT-4 to create a similar PowerShell script, and the output code looked like the one seen by Proofpoint, including variable names and comments further indicating it is likely that AI was used to generate this. Yep. It's like, instru- it looks like instructions to a lab, <laughs> low-key. Like legit, yeah. But yeah, this is some, okay, update. Added clarifications from Daniel Blackford, director of Threat Research at Proofpoint, received at the publishing time. Oh, okay. But yeah, so they did say that they are trying to block some nation state actors associated with like China, Iran, and Russia. So they can't really be using generative AI to do malicious stuff. So yeah, charcoal, typhoon, salmon, typhoon, crimson storm. But yeah, these are some of the things that we we are, will be facing when it comes to dealing with AI. And I think eventually it's going to get smarter. Like every year is like, there used to be this thing where it said computing power doubles every, what, I think it used to be like 18 months or something like that. That time has gotten shortened. Like everything's faster and faster. Even with, I think, then they showed Chat GPT rendering out like a, I don't know if it's Chat GPT, but some AI thing rented out like a person walking in the rain and some other crap. But you know, there's still some things that get wrong. Words, fingers, like the details. They're really bad at the details right now when it comes to people. But like, for example, a lot of the cover art that I do for the, the podcast, I'll go into a Microsoft, what is it? Being MS Creator, whatever if Microsoft, that the AI creator thing, and I'll type in what I need and it'll make me a, a thing and I'll use it for the podcast though and normally it's not that good (laughs) so normally you have to go in and fix it or you have to no go ahead 
I was going to say, do you have to normally go in and fix it or do you feel like you just have to, that just gives you some inspo to work from? So I try to find something that doesn't have any words or someone like sometimes it'll unnecessarily make someone with words on the background. I was like, I don't need that AI. And so that's what I try to just avoid having words on the stuff. But those well, really these last what, four articles we looked at, these are ways you can kind of shape sounding more prepared in interviews, just keeping up with these big breaches. Like, and what I try to do sometimes is if I'm getting ready for an interview, I'll go see if the company I'm about to interview with, they ever had like a big breach or whatever. So I could see like what affected them a while back and figure out what problems they may still be dealing with or based on the industry, what they're worried about. I do that all the time. So that's a, that's a little nugget. You know, look, look for attacks that the industry you're going to be working in, what type, what do they face? And and see maybe what you can attribute to that based on your skill set or you know even your viewpoint. You may not have a lot of skills at the time, but just come and prepare it makes you look a little bit better. And you don't have to be an expert at being able to kind of understand what's going on in the article either. Like if you're able to understand the key concepts on how it happened and maybe how it can be prevented or how they could have prevented it, then you're good to go. They're not you're not expected to be a, a researcher who can go and manipulate this um, or re whatever the word I'm looking for, reenact this. Are you talking about like reversing it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just being able to have a simple conversation about it and you'll be good. All right, guys. So now we're going to get to the fun part where we like to react to TikToks. And we got one. Well, we got one for you. I don't know. These are all blind reactions. I think I watched a little bit of this video, but I didn't finish it because I just I felt what she was saying. So we're gonna share this one and we're gonna play it. Let's go to the beginning. My unpopular opinion when it comes to college is if you know your mom ain't got no money, your daddy ain't got no money, and you ain't got no money, you better use a major in college that's gonna make you some money. And she might be, but once you decide what type of lifestyle you're trying to live, you better make sure you choose that degree wisely or that career choice wisely because it, it ain't no joke out here. I went to a performing arts high school, a government school, and I thought I wanted to be an actress or like some type of like screenwriter. And I was going to go. You ever notice, and it's something I've noticed from TikTok outside of what the subject matter is, but have you noticed the people who get out of views, they always doing something with their hands or doing some crap? Coming back yeah, to the because it was it was so unserious when she made that video. Like she was, she was doing. I'm taking my polish off. So while I'm doing that, it wasn't. It was. It's, it doesn't give you. Um, this is super planned, and this is a moment that I gotta that I've made and carved in my day. Well, not even that. I noticed it's a, it's a little hack. All the people that I watch, they do move up into the camera. They do some stuff with the hands. They rubbing. Like uh, one of the guys, I'll, I'll take, I'll show you his stuff behind the scenes or whatever. But he, he's bigger on TikTok too. He, they're always doing something, and I think it's to keep your attention. But I, it's one of the things I've always noticed of like doing this because that is a good way to keep people engaged. Is talking with your hands. People are very visual, so if you can talk with your hands and, and do all this other stuff, which is why in person episodes probably work the best because people can see your hands or expressions or doing all that crap. But let's see what else she's going to say, and then we'll get to, like, some better ones. I want to go to some, like, communications program or whatever. But then I kept hearing my mom tell me no for different things, and I couldn't get certain stuff. And not that I had to get everything or I was entitled to everything. It just was like, dang, dang, it's really hard out here. So I had met this woman in church, in the church that I was growing up in. I met her. And, and she, she always, always seemed like she was living a life. life. Like, like she, she was, was traveling. traveling. Like, like she always, always kept herself up, up hair done, nails, nails done, done, everything big. Like, like everything. <laughs> she's just real fancy. So, so I, I asked her what she did for a living, and she was like, "I'm an auditor." <clears throat> she was a certified internal auditor or whatever. And I was like, oh, "Okay, cool." I was like, "Seems like it's a cool occupation." She loved it. She was traveling with work or whatever, so they were paying for her to travel. And so when I started school, I asked her what her major was. So I ended up switching my major to accounting after I started college as a communications major. Um, and then I went 
through uh, the accounting program. And then I came out and I became an auditor, just like her. I've been an auditor for 15 years now. Is it the most exciting job? No, it's not. Am I passionate about it? Not really. But it's actually allowed me to live a really, really decent lifestyle. And I'm not mad at that. And I think the other good thing about being an auditor is that you don't actually have to go to, you don't go to school for auditing. That's not like, that's not a major to my knowledge now. Anyway, um, I did take an auditing class. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing it. Let me go back to this. Uh, so the premise of everything is like, hey, like the beginning of the video, the girl's like, if your mom ain't got no money, your daddy ain't money, ain't nobody got no money, go to school, pick you a major that's going to make some money. And I agree with that. I have a post I did a long time ago on Facebook say, hey, find a job that's going to make some money. Follow your dreams once you get the money that you can probably do what you got to do and follow your dreams or whatever. But like, don't go to school trying to, oh, I want to be this or I see some people that go to school, general studies, or they just major in something that we just know based on today's time, because it's not the 80s and 90s where you can have a, you know, $35,000, $40,000 job and live and have an okay life. Those days are over. So I was like, if you don't find something that's going to be making you make more than an average American, that's the issue. And so hats off for her to being realistic because... We do act like we have like a lot of people. There are people that we do get to look into like we like what we do. Then there are people, like you say, she said, hey, I'm not passionate about it, but it allows me to live a decent life or a life that I want to live. I think that is, I think that's commendable to actually say that to people and not just be like faking, oh, I love it and doing all this other stuff. Because that's what we see. That's why I get people to real. I'm like, hey, I talk about cybersecurity, but no. Working in this field may not be for you if you're not trying to be a lifelong learner. <laughs> I agree with everything she said, especially the like the girl who started the video off, because I kind of feel like um, that your future is something that you can control. So if you come from, you know, an environment that you're not happy with, if you come from instability, if you come from, you know, being let down, if you come from not being able to be able to afford like the things you want to do or just go to places and stuff like that, then these should be driving to me. I think they should be driving factors as to what you decide to do in your career and the future and long term. It was one of the driving factors why I went back and got my master's because it just wasn't cutting it. What I was the life I was living beforehand, I wasn't I wasn't even remotely living the life that I had idolized for myself myself. So I feel like I don't know. I just I resonate with that on the on the on the same level as she did because that was something that I did and that's kind of how I approached the situation. Like I know how I grew up and I know what I want for myself and what is in between those two. Um so I, I definitely agree with that. I think it's important for you to consider those things, especially if you hate where you're at right now. You you have a choice and that's the only thing that you got to know is that you got a choice and you can create whatever reality it is that you want. Yeah, I know. For me, like I said, college of business, seen 80,000, 100,000 on those, those uh, information system jobs. I said, sign me up. Yep. And I feel like also for me, a lot of the things that I'm passionate about, I don't really know how to make money on them yet. So I feel like that's, like you said, that's what I was going to add. Like you said, um, you know, get the bag right now. And then once you get the bag, then you can pour into the things that you love to do. And I mean, that's not for everybody. This advice isn't for everybody. But, you you know, if this is for you, you know, you know, we talking to you. Yeah. I mean, hey, I seen a post. I don't know if it was blonde or something, but uh, a lady was talking about like they either they had retired or something. Her husband just delivers pieces now because he like, I guess they did really good financially. Let me see. I'll be, I'll be, be saying some crazy stuff on blonde. Like I'll be like, bro, y'all is really, y'all are wild. And and shout out to another subscriber of mine. Yeah, the people that follow me. I, I don't think I posted it on YouTube, but um, he's been watching my content for like three years, and now he's got his first sock analyst offer, going from working in a warehouse. So I want to tell people it could be doable, and he's probably going to get close to eighty thousand dollars. 
And like I tell everybody, y'all can be fooled by TikTok if you want, but that's life changing money for a lot of people. Man, what I remember, please don't let these people fool you. Don't let the hype get to your head. If you never made it, if you never made that before, who are you to say that that ain't no money? Yeah. We're not talking to the people who make it more than that. We're talking to the people who haven't made that yet. It is definitely life changing. Dang. I know y'all probably and, see and that. that'll that'll motivate you to be like, oh, okay, I got this. Then now I can now I can get to a hundred. Then when you get to a hundred, oh, now I can get to. It mm. just allows you to be able to dream bigger and think bigger. Yeah, and um. This is going to be totally random because it's not related to anything we're talking about. But I was looking for that screenshot or the post from Blonde just now, and I didn't find it. But my ESPN notifications just told me OJ Simpson died at 76 oh, years you're old. You're lying. I promise it right said. Right now, former, today? Yeah, former NFL player OJ Simpson dies at 76 after undergoing cancer treatment. Oh, no. I don't believe you. I believe you, but let me look it up myself. Yeah, my, oh, um, my God. I mean, my cousin, he had a picture of OJ, because I didn't even know OJ was from, like, Louisiana, Shreveport, I believe. He got some people. Oh, my there. God. He was so he was real. Like, that made me want to watch. Have you ever watched? Uh, yes. Yeah. Which one I'm talking about? The one on the one that was on um, with Cuba? Yeah. What did I? Every episode, he ate that. He ate it. Up. Huh? I said with Courtney B. Vance playing Johnny Cox. Yeah, it was like the trial, like when yeah. they were talking about the tree. That was now that I don't know if there's other OJ Simpson shows, but that one was so yeah. good. So if you haven't seen it, please go watch it. If the glove don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> hey, listen. Oh, man, ah oh, man, that's 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 messed up, man. Um, but let me see. This was a. I think we got two more. I I, I wanted to talk about this one too. Um, let me go to this one. Not give you certain information you need on a, a task or an assignment, and they do this to make you look bad in front of the bosses. Like if you if you don't get something done, but they did it on purpose. They didn't give you that information you needed to get that job done. Again, they're trying to sabotage you. Also, you will have managers who will be plotting on you since day one to try to get you out of there, try to get rid of you. And a lot of times I've found out it's not the manager who hired you, but the one right under them. A lot of times they feel insecure about you for some reason. I, I found this out in most jobs I've been to in corporate America. It's always like the assistant boss that tries to get you out of there. They'll, they'll, they're the ones doing the microaggressions. They're the ones thinking saying little sneaky stuff to you uh, to try to make you upset. And you have to really watch out for those. Um, they will literally put you in positions trying to set you up to fail. They will put you in an impossible task. They will give you an impossible assignment. That way, when it comes out and the boss, the main boss is looking at you crazy because you didn't get because you didn't get this impossible task done. And that was all on purpose. See, they want to put you in these impossible scenarios so your reputation takes a hit then this is something i've dealt with and i've seen other black employees deal with in my time um working then you'll have some white co-workers who will literally say racial slurs on purpose to try to get a reaction out of you because they know deep down they know and if he if he reacts how i think he's going to react then it's going to be bad news for him because they're not going to believe him they're going to believe me or if you even if you don't retaliate in that way, they know that you won't be able to go to management or HR because they're not going to believe you or not going to really care. Um, they will. So he said a lot. I don't know what he started off in part one, but he definitely said a lot. I've dealt with some of those. I've seen friends deal with some of the I've dealt with the, the microaggressions before. I haven't dealt with people saying you know, slurs and stuff to me like that. I haven't dealt with that type of stuff. I know one of my, my friends, he dealt with it before uh, at our company. And he, he threatened, he, he said something to do to where he didn't say it no more because he was like, all right, I'm either going to go to HR, I'm going to slap you or something. He said something to him. But you, this is one of the games you play and you find out with corporate and also if you go to HR, 
it, it was a freaking fishbowl screenshot that I actually want to talk about with you. And the, the person was like, um, let me see if I can find it real quick. I want to say he said, hey, I went to HR about my boss and now I got I was fired. I believe that's what he said. While you're looking for it, I myself personally have haven't necessarily experienced that stuff, but I have a ton of friends who have. And I feel like even though I haven't experienced it because I care for my friends, you know, that type of stuff does bother me. So I try to give them advice on how to navigate in that situation. But um, for me, the first and most important thing to do if you're a believer is to stay prayed up. Uh, because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So if you're covered there, then you have a little bit more. Um, you have a little bit more of a cushion, I feel like, when it comes to dealing with those situations. But also know that if you are in that situation and you don't do anything about it, that you are setting us people of color up to continuously have to deal with those things so if this is happening to you try to take up try to take a stand you know in the way that you can try to bring the situation to the forefront as opposed to you just trying to kind of turn a blind eye to it because there'll be someone under you there'll be someone after you and if you don't address it then you're just adding to that terrible culture in that environment so be the change that you wish to see, I would say there. Um, I haven't been in that situation, but the day that I do, please believe. <laughs> so just just know that. Other way. Uh tap it's it probably there in so my it can focus. Or send it to me. I can put no. it there. Oh no, but I see it. I was laid off because I went to HR to report my man to report my manager for discrimination and harassment. Did you document everything? Yeah, so sometimes if you do that, they may not get them out of there. They'll get you out of there. So you have to be careful with a little bit of finesse because HR is there to protect the company, not you. And you have to, once you realize that, it's cool. So you can just document everything. And if you have to be ready for when you make that move and thinking that they're going to do something to you if they don't. And if they do lay you off and you document everything, get you an employment lawyer. Yeah, and with the money. because that people do get terminated wrongly and if you do take action you will receive a resolution you might not get the you ain't gonna get the job back but you can get some something out of that situation not being handled properly so that's something i feel like we don't do we don't follow up like we'll be the one in the situation who was wrongfully terminated but we just leave it there we don't we don't take action after that so believe in yourself take action yeah, a close friend of mine, he uh, he did that, and he was able to to get a resolution and one uh, a, a bit of money off of that. So that was that was pretty cool. So yeah, the micro uh, microaggressions and trying to set you up for fail. I, I dealt with a situation one time about um, a particular person was trying to see if trying to see if our our, our cue or something was working and proceeded to call a couple of times knowing that you could have just looked up to see who was at work and, and asked them first before trying to get on a call and, and make, you know, me at the time kind of look bad. I was like, that's just BS or anytime. It's just stuff you realize like anytime, you know, I do something, it's a big deal, but everybody else is not a big deal. So stuff like that, you, you start witnessing and then you just have to move accordingly. That that's how I feel about, that type of activity and everybody's not able to do that because they kind of get emotional about it. I mean, as you said, because like if you're trying your hardest and doing this, is you're like, why are you not a lot of the same type of mistakes or grace that others get? But yeah, I feel like a mentor here is key too. I have like specific people that I can reach out to in my life that are part mm -hmm. of my community who can give me more situational guidance. And I feel like that's also important. It's important to have someone mentor you on how to, how do I do this? How do I do that? But it's also important to have somebody that you can kind of lean on to help you navigate when you are in challenges like that. And that's, 
another aspect of mentorship as well that we don't talk about a lot. We only talk about what can I learn from you? What can you learn from me? But also, can you give me any guidance on this uh, terrible manager I got or this derailer who's on my team who just, I feel like they're always coming for me. And, you know, after you have that conversation with a couple of people, you might be able to look at the situation differently and be able to handle that situation We're differently so have a different outcome. No, I agree for sure. I, I agree for sure. And I think this is going to be the last one we react to. This is one about personality hires. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool because me as a career coach, I do try to tell people a lot of times about, you know, we, we hit a term about culture fit and you fit with the culture and those different type of things that sometimes based on your personality, it works for them. But sometimes there are people who don't know nothing at all and they just uh, personality culture fit. And they're in maybe in a, a role that requires you to do work and they don't know how to do it. So we are going to look at this really quick. And, and this one, since it's longer, I'm probably going to stop it in between so we can react to what they're saying. There's are arguably more important than good. So in his video, he says that he's going to get a lot of people pissed off. I'm pissed off people right here. Big mad. OK, obviously not at him. It's his opinion that triggered a past experience. <laughs> Okay, so let me tell you what happened and then how I got through it, how I mitigate it as a leader. All right. So I worked um, at this company and this big, great personality hire was brought on, obviously killed the interview and things like that. Everyone was like, oh, this person's so great, so great. I thought that they were so great. Well, after I would say several weeks, maybe a few months, it was clear that this person couldn't do the job. Just as he said, zero experience. Did we ask all the right questions? Obviously, probably not, right? But we got like kind of blinded by the personality. Well, my boss at this point was very much like thinking that this person was blessed and highly favored. They could do no wrong. And what I started to notice is that in meetings, this person would suggest these huge ideas and then try to like get me to do their work. <laughs> I just want to stop it right there. Ain't there some somebody... Oh, yeah, we should do all this. All right, well, you do it. I was hoping you can do it. It's going to be a no for me, dog. Yeah. Was Randy Jackson? Oh, no, Randy, whatever his name was. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a no for me, dog. And I'm going to tell you immediately, no. Yeah, I, I would too, especially like if you need some guidance, maybe, but the whole thing, nah. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is going on here? Right? Okay. So, um, fast forward to I'm constantly doing this person's work because they didn't know how to do it. And I finally reached my breaking point when they started to like outwardly say it. Oh, well, Jermaine can do this and Jermaine can do that. What? Do I have to do my own job, right? right? Well, one, one day, we're day we're in a meeting and this person has an idea that I'm like, that, that doesn't, doesn't even make sense. What are you even talking about? But I just decided I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to like make any suggestions, make any alternatives. I'm just going to sit here. My boss turns to me and says, oh yeah, you can just execute on that. I can just do what, I don't know what came over me, but I look back at my boss and I said, you know what I think? I think that they should execute on it. And my boss was like, what? And I said, this is such a big idea and they know exactly probably how it should be executed on because they have the vision. So I think that they should do it. This person, the personality hire turns like beat red but <gasps> right okay so what happens they crash and burn my boss is furious my boss is old school boomer okay like the shouting the like it was bad okay but i was just like how many times did this person throw me under the bus how many times did this person give me extra work and i was just like eventually the person did get let go because they couldn't do the work anymore my boss was done dealing with the like the personality because they wanted work done at that point yeah, that is. I want. I wish I would. I want to befriend her because I want to see like what what does she do, and what type of role is it that this person can't get this work done? Because stuff like this always goes back into what we always talk about when we say the line on your resume and stuff. Yep. Only so far you can get. 
you may be there for about six, seven months. But after that six month mark is when they want you to wrap it up. You can't wrap it up. You're gonna be walking. <laughs> and and even on top of that, being a personality hire is cool, but the something else gotta give outside of that personality. Like mm -hmm. you still have to have a skill set. You can even still be feel like you're the personality hire. But what are you bringing to the table that you can offer the team that you know is beneficial? Not even on some, oh, well, I, I just, I, I enjoy scheduling team bonding activities. Cool. That's awesome. But what work are you doing to drive the team towards their goals and metrics? All right. What is it giving? Yeah. It's, it's given not working. It's given so personality say, hire. <laughs> over the course of my career, after that experience, was kind of early on. I really paid attention when I figured out that someone might be a personality hire. And if I was able to, I moved away from them very quickly, tried to have very little interaction with them because I have found that personality hires often try to push their work onto other people. And particularly in his video, he states something like anyone can push buttons. Anyone can send emails like, yeah, kind of, but like for the people that are trying to consistently improve and do great work and just want to do their own work, I, I don't want to help you figure it out, right? I'm not getting a piece of your salary. So you do what this responsibilities in your description that has nothing to do with me, okay? If I am on the same team as them, I am very cognizant of them trying to get me to do work. And what I'll now say is, why don't you put it together? And I would be happy to take a look as a second set of eyes if you need me to. Or I would say, well, you know, like, hey, I don't know what the boss wants. So like, why don't you talk with them directly? And I try to stay out of it now. As a person that has led a number of teams, I don't tolerate personality hires. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care at all. Here's what I want to know. I want to know if you can do the job. I want to make sure that you have respect for other people, that you can respect me. I will certainly respect you, that you're a good communicator and the like. Okay? Because, like, this notion of, like, personality and all of that, there are some people that are introverts. There are some people that... Are neurodivergent there are people that you can't necessarily immediately gain a sense of their personality and they might be fantastic and that is what i have found is that some like very quiet people have done phenomenal work i don't know i just so yeah uh i think it's daniel oh yeah he definitely hit hit a button <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I, I think like especially when she was talking about like the you know neurodivergent people and other type of people like getting their personalities and I, I teach my clients a lot of times like your hardest part in in the interview process will be like selling yourself. I think the hard part is I don't think too many black people get hired as personality hires. Me personally. Not unless you're extremely jazz fingers in your face. You know, not unless if you're like that, then, yeah, uh, but if you know what? Yeah, these are not yeah. spirit fingers. These <laughs> are spirit fingers. But yeah, um, I agree with you too because we got to be two times as smart, two times as fast, two times as educated, two seven times as experienced. So I don't personality hires definitely exist, but I feel like for for people of color, it's more the lines are more blurred. Because you you still gotta you gotta do more. I wish people thought like her though, because I think that would get rid of a lot of the hiring biases that we have because you they want you to fit in a certain way. Like I said, there are times when people because they like people being on camera, they want you to be on camera just because of it. And ain't nothing in your job or HR policy to say you gotta be on camera, but they want you to be on camera doing like short meetings, not things that are even important, like so there are things like that, like that are stupid, <laughs> but somebody may try to gauge on you or gauge your background or, oh, they didn't smile, you know? Cause I like I, what she said. Yeah. I like what she said at the end where she was like, lack of people there are people, there are people who are quiet, who still do great work. Yeah. And that that's a bit, everybody's not an extrovert, period. Exactly. And that's why I also tell people, hey, maybe find jobs based on your personality type, too, because I don't need you to be extra bubbly in personality when your job probably has like five percent meetings, if that. 
I just need to know if you can do the work. Yep. So that's the thing. And and eventually we'll get into, and we might, I might have to do, we, I might have to really do some studying for an episode that I want to do on this DEI. I've had friends that's worked at D, DEI and big companies and they've all talked about like how it's really just like, they uh, like companies are really unserious about it. They just kind of had these departments that say they do. I, I like I, I think I told you in uh through the phone about talking to my director friend now about how they went through hundreds of interviews being a black woman and they only had one interview with a black person on the interview panel that happened to be a black woman. And so you know, a lot of people think that the will other races say, oh, you all guys are always complaining about race and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, we know people have their biases. It's prevalent <laughs> every day. Right. And talking it, to her. I'm before, sorry you didn't experience it. Yeah. And talking it's nothing her, you want to experience. A lot of my suspicions of what actually happens in the job search process of uh, some things why you possibly didn't get the job and it's, it's, it's disheartening but I would tell a lot of people now, hey, jobs, these cybersecurity jobs say you need experience, but they don't always say you need paid experience. So if you're looking for a way to get in, I would advise you to start an LLC with a company. And if you can get a contract job, get a contract job, see if they can do 1099 or C to C and kind of go from there. Because right now in this market, contract jobs and C to C stuff is actually the wave. They've been hiring way quicker than Speak on it. They've been hiring much faster than those other roles for whatever reason. The full time jobs seem like they just take an application to take them. They take forever to even send you uh, either a uh, what's the thing they call you a rejection if you get one at all <laughs> at this point. And so that actually was a video that I put in there to TikTok. It was a, a young man. I think he was in school at the time. And so he said he had put in like 1,600 applications, only got one offer, and the offer was mm. for Costco. And he said no to that. And so I checked that on my For You page again on TikTok. Uh, I don't know if this guy's an actual tech recruiter. Not everybody's saying what they are on TikTok, but we're going to assume that he's telling the truth. And he was saying, hey, a lot of these companies, they're just not hiring at all. He was just like, I'm a technical recruiter. I get rejected from my own company. And he was saying how they're just posting a post and – I seen something like that, and and they were talking about how they are doing research too, like employers and stuff with those job postings where they really don't have. Like everyone keeps saying they're urgently hiring, but are you really? Right. It's not giving it's urgent. Urgently hiring, like you know, what's taking so long? Like it, it is a lot. Like I mean, even you know, getting referred to stuff and and still not yet hearing anything is okay. Like what's the deal? What's taking so long to even just have a recruiter like hit my line? Like all those different type of things. It's like, it's a lot. So I always feel for my clients and I just tell them to keep on chopping at the tree. I mean, there are companies, like, don't get me wrong, there are places that are hiring, but I think by Q, the end of Q2, Q3, we'll probably see some more hiring because I saw it ramp up at the end of Q1. So I would just tell you to be, do like keep your I would just say to stay diligent in your job search and network as much as you can, man. I, I know that it's not just you too. Everybody yeah. right now is kind of experiencing similar things. So don't feel like you didn't do something right. No, there are a lot of talented people who are facing difficulty finding a job. So keep prevailing on What's for you is for you, and it will align up for you. Yeah, we got people that 10, 15, 20 years still having job um, search issues. And I'm going to leave you guys with this. I, I posted on my LinkedIn about, hey, the days of just applying or getting a random referral are over. You need to try to find somebody that's connected to the hiring manager on the team and try to get a referral that way, preferably from somebody that's doing well on the team. Because if they can speak highly of you, then you have a good shot at least of getting an interview. And hopefully you can knock out the interview. Because just getting a referral from somebody that just worked there, it don't mean much. It don't. It don't. Yep. And 
you need help finding the people that work there. Book a call or or get the group coaching. I got you. Got worksheets. We got we got videos that actually show you step by step on how to do this thing. I promise you, it's it's as easy as I make it sound. But we are at the end of today's episode. I want to see if, if Destiny had anything she wants to leave you guys with. Um, nothing. I don't really have anything. If you're on your journey and you're studying, keep on studying. Um, it'll pay off. I promise you. You'll come back and be like, she was right because everyone who poured that into me was right. And I made sure to go back and tell them, thank you for pouring that into me at a time where I was feeling discouraged. Also, if you're in the process of looking for a job, keep pushing on, keep applying, keep practicing your interviewing skills, keep networking. Um, something's going to land in your, op- an opportunity is going to land in your lap for you. And that's all I got. Just sending positive vibes to everybody. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. Leave us some comments. We love interacting. And make sure you subscribe to the Patreon. See y'all later. And I just want to add, like I said, subscribe to the Patreon. But I just want to add, is also, like I said, um, don't be discouraged. Keep up the good fight. Find people that believe in you and you guys build up your own community and work at it and, and keep working at your skills. If you're doing labs or you're getting a certification, do not stop learning. After you do that, practice some of those skills every day to help this stuff stick with you. That's one of the main problems I see people do. They'll go through a course and then after that, they won't do the stuff anymore. So uh, just do that. Get on your LinkedIn's, everybody. Get on your LinkedIn's. I'm telling you, they're hiring. But, your Zoom. <laughs> but until <laughs> next time, like I always say, let's stay textual and we out. Peace.